everyone who's not able to make it can catch up on this um, lovely guest talk we have today. And yes, so I'm going to start. It's my uh, pleasure to be able to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Jeremy Leggett. And uh, before I get into uh, more of a bio of our speaker, I'm just going to remind everyone for the Zoom logistics for our guest talks. Um, it's great if you want to keep your videos on. Uh, if not, if, you're, if that's not comfortable, that's fine too. And we ask that we just, yeah, you just keep yourselves muted when you're not speaking and when the speaker is talking uh, to avoid hearing any geckos or echoes in the background. And um, we, and so then after about 30 minutes, um, Jeremy can let you know if you're welcome to ask questions while he's speaking, but sometimes that's hard to see when you're screen sharing. Um, but we'll have a time for Q and A in the second half. And at that point, I'll ask you to type your questions into the chat and the instructors and I can sort of look through them and either group similar questions if some if there's a theme coming up in a lot of your questions um, or call on you to ask your question if uh, we see it and it's, and it's a good one and there's time. And so just bear with me while I moderate those questions. There's um, gonna be a lot more of you than usual. And so, if you see, if you like someone else's question too, do pay attention to that and maybe put a plus one so we can um, rise up some of the, the common questions. Um, so that's it for Zoom Logistics. So with that, I will get into uh, my introduction. So Jeremy um, has been focused on climate change and carbon for large, a large part of his life. Um, he began as a lecturer at the Royal School of Mines at the Imperial College of Science and Technology, researching earth history, including the creation of carbonaceous shale, um, funded among others by BP and Shell, and won the Lyle Fund of the Geological Society for that work in 1987. But worried about climate change, he resigned to become a climate campaigner. And while with Greenpeace as the scientific director of the climate campaign, he wrote and edited Global Warming, an Oxford University Press book in 1990 that emphasized carbon arithmetic and the reasons why only a fraction of fossil fuel reserves could be burned. In 1997, he founded a solar company, Solar Century, as a vehicle for climate solutions campaigning in the markets. Um, and this company, on the board of which he served throughout, has since become one of the most successful solar developers in the world, with exponential growth of profits in recent years. And in November 2020, it merged with Statkraft, the Norwegian State Renewables. Um, in 2010, Jeremy became the first chair of the Carbon Tracker Initiative, a think tank of financial and policy analysts aiming to align the capital markets with international climate policy targets. Um, and Carbon Tracker aims to improve the transparency of carbon risk disclosure and accounting. Um, the organization has received unprecedented traction in the financial world, and many foundations support it and mainstream financial analysts now routinely use the unburnable carbon and stranded assets themes that the organization set out in its first report in 2011. Um, in February 2020, Jeremy has embarked on another carbon-themed environmental and social purpose project to create a holistic and biodiverse carbon sink nature reserve on a 1,200-acre estate in Scotland. He called it the Boonloit Wildland Project. So this is an amazing guest talk to kick off our series during this course, uh, because Jeremy's work spans so many different sectors of climate mitigation opportunities from energy to land use. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kamal to give a short personal introduction, and then um, we'll hear from Jeremy. Thank you, Lainey. Um, I just want to say how extremely delighted I am to have Jeremy joining us for this first talk of, of this cohort. Um, and for, for many reasons, uh, but one of the main reasons is because uh, he was actually my very first boss. Um, he supervised my master's dissertation project at Oxford, and then he was starting Solar Century, and I was third or second and a half or third employee at Solar Century, um, way back in the late 1990s. And um, so it's a real uh, delight for me to have him back here now with us. Uh, I'll just say a couple, a couple of quick, quick things about that time. Um, one of the things I really took away from my time at Solar Century was, and Jeremy sort of really kind of, I would say represented this, was this idea that nothing is impossible. And just to give you some context, we, you know, we started this solar company at a time 
when solar was insanely expensive and there was absolutely no retail market whatsoever in the UK. This was literally the first company that essentially created the entire retail market in the UK for solar. Um, and you know, all of us were really into the mission, but Jeremy literally lived the mission. And what do I mean by that? The very first uh, solar tile, roof tile installation was actually installed by Solar Century at Jeremy's house, where he was actually living at the time. And every weekend he would host an open house at his own residence and let complete strangers in walk through was just so they could like check out the system and hopefully buy, buy a system as well. So he really literally lived the mission. And um, so I'm again, very thankful to have him here. And you know, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Jeremy. Thank you so much, Kamal. Happy days, a long time ago. Let me see if I can remember how to drive the technology. Um, uh, what did I do? I managed to make it work before, didn't I? I shrunk the file. That's uh, that just give me 30 seconds here. Um, no here worries. Here's the... Uh, that's the file. Now I go share screen, uh, and there I see my um, presentation. My dog dog is barking because he's found a mouse somewhere. I might have to shut him out in a minute. Uh, share that. Uh, no, that's. Right. Here we are. This is it. Can you see it? If I go up to a full screen and shut shut the door so that the dog is. How's that? Can everyone see it? Yes, it's great, yes, Jeremy. That's great. Well, okay, so off I go. I'll talk for half an hour or so. And um, and they'd be happy to answer any uh, any questions. I guess it's a bit, a bit difficult to sort of jump in otherwise. So um, yes, the 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 thing about the solar industry is that um, it's been very difficult for a large part of the energy industry to uh, to accept what what our potential was. And Kamal very kindly described the belief that some of us had way back in the beginning of the century. But even as the drama started to unfold, you see in this famous um, diagram from the IEA, the actual growth of the global solar PV market. Every year, their forecasts, you know, just assume it's all going to tail off and either flatten or in some cases um, decline. Um, and you, you, you wonder, how is it possible? There's something really cultural going on here. Of course, they argue these aren't forecasts, they're just scenarios, but most of the energy world takes their scenarios as forecasts, especially when they, they call them things like new policies scenario. So this is what um, our industry has lived through, is living through, and it's, it's quite a drama of um, different belief systems, really. Um, and for the oil and gas industry, there's a, a, a pretty big, um, I would say, existential question. You, you know, it's not as though they, they didn't see what was coming. When Kamal and I were starting off in the company in 2000, BP um, were engaged in a dramatic rebranding blitz, uh, calling themselves Beyond Petroleum. And here's one of their ads from the time, 25 years, we've never seen a solar crisis. This kind, of, um, uh, this kind of advertising appearing in airports all over the world, they really seem to be getting it. And so you, you then think, how have we gone? How is it possible for this industry to go from that level of realization shared with the pioneers way back 20 years ago to this? And now this is from Davos in January, this year, and it shows the capex expenditure of the entire oil and gas industry. It takes a minute to get into this diagram, but um, what you're looking at is the expenditure of every oil and gas company in the world, and it's less than 1% fully four years after the, the Paris Agreement. What a shocking story that is. 
And um, especially so when the stakes are so manifestly high for this industry, you know, it's not just hyperbole from ex-environmentalists. This is the Financial Times, the front page of the Financial Times, talking about big oil survival being at stake in a world where everything has changed from April this year. So this is the backdrop to our story. And I'm going to go chronologically through it, starting in 1990, because we've had this warning about climate change ever since that time, um, as I'm sure most, if not all of you will know, um, this was when the first meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change took place. And their warning then, and this is many of the world's most eminent climate scientists, their warning then was really stark. You know, their best estimate was a ruinous global warming of uh, heating at four degrees Celsius on the average um, in the century in which we're now living. And at one level, that hasn't changed very much. Um, ever since it's become more sophisticated in the analysis, but it's, it, you know, it's still way above um, where the Paris ceiling was set in December 2015, um, when governments finally negotiated some kind of climate treaty with teeth. So that's the backdrop. And for those who are interested in the history of all this drama, I've, I've written two books spanning the, the main years of, through the 1990s to the beginning of this century. And then latterly in the run up to Paris, uh, the years 2013 to 2015. Um, and so I won't have time to dive into a lot of detail, but these books, um, you know, tell the story as I've seen it in the front lines. And I'll just be giving you some snapshots uh, as we go through with the emphasis on solar and entrepreneurship. So BP's pivot um, didn't last long in the new age of exploration. There's the then CEO, Lord Brown, um, in the Black Gold Rush and, you know, Exxon unleashed. They've been unleashed ever since, um, uh, plowing oil, the oil and gas furrow and doing everything they can to subvert progress on dealing with climate change. But um, BP's initial enthusiasm for solar in 2000 was bang on the money. What you're looking at here, if you haven't seen this famous diagram, people in the industry love this diagram. Alliance Bernstein analysts call it the Terra Dome. And it's the, the average price of solar from 2006 through to 2013, measured against fossil fuel indices. Details don't matter. But you see the picture. I mean, that is a absolutely dramatic descent in average prices. And that's what this industry has created and, and ridden. And Solar Century has been a part of that through the story. And here you see the same kind of picture with our growth um, superimposed on it. We've actually, it doesn't really matter in detail, but we've actually grown a little bit faster than the global market through this period, particularly from uh, 2010 onwards. You know, the first 10 years were very rough and difficult. Um, and I'll, that, I'll tell you about those as well as the, 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 the exponential growth. Uh, but we've ridden this pterodome. And, and I think the thing to think, remembering here that the scale of the prices is a log scale, is just imagine what we could have done if BP um, had kept going with that rebranding stuff and the others had gone with them, you know, how much further we would have got down the road to um, addressing this dreadful problem of climate change. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people are going to have to live with in that industry. And some of them may have to face retrospective liability questions going forward as a result of what happened. Anyway, back to 1999, and this is the house that Kamal was talking about. It was Britain's first solar roof tile home, and here are the solar roof tiles um, manufactured by the now bankrupt um, US company United Solar, amorphous silicon, and with energy efficiency in the house, you know, I was able to generate with that little solar roof more electricity than I used, even in cloudy Britain, way back there at the beginning of the century. Um, this was our first 
uh, installation out in the British countryside. And Kamal will remember this one too. It's a nice story. It was so expensive. This is solar and batteries, so expensive that, um, uh, you know, you could never have sold it to anyone else except a man who was facing the prospect of not getting married to his fiance because she said she wouldn't marry him unless he installed electricity in the farmhouse. And the utility um, said, well, we can do it, but it will cost you an arm and a leg. Um, and so he looked for solar and batteries and we could do it at slightly less expense than the arm and the leg. And that was our first installation. Uh, by the turn of the century, it was getting a bit more sophisticated, but we were having to do things like pa power the petrol pumps. And this is our first, the first of several um, solar powered uh, petrol filling stations um, at, a, at, at a, a retail park. We were by 2001, you know, doing hybrid installations. This is solar electric and solar thermal. And with energy efficiency, tension to energy efficiency, you know, we were getting close to zero emissions, even uh, zero carbon, even then back in at the turn of the century. By 2006, we were um, uh, engineering and designing our own products, solar roof tiles, um, electric roof tiles, the dark ones, and um, uh, solar thermal roof tiles, the pale ones. So you had combined heat and power in these homes, which were again, close to zero carbon because of the energy efficiency performance. And we, we really believed in um, building integrated photovoltaics, both in residential and in commercial. This is our first commercial installation. It nearly bankrupted us because we didn't make a penny of profit on that. It's the headquarters of a bank, which I think tells us well, there's a lesson somewhere. Suffice it to say, we never did another in installation like this in the history of the company, which is kind of sad because it's it's a beautiful installation. It looks like a sort of futuristic blue marble thing and provides a heck of a lot of electricity. So other lessons from the time, if um, I'm sure we have many aspiring entrepreneurs here, and one lesson is probably um, it's a bad idea to invite a head of state to visit your startup company. Here you see four heads of state um, and four solar companies and um, all but one of them have subsequently gone bankrupt. Uh, of course, modesty prevents me from saying which one was lucky enough not to. So this was the first of our four phases through the valley of death to our first products, those solar roof tiles that you've seen. Um, I, the, the company was uh, unfortunate enough to have me as the chief executive for that phase. Uh, but fortunately, you know, some founders struggle on, but I didn't e have either the ability or the wish to struggle on um, through the serious phase. So I was fortunate in finding a wonderful CEO, there have been three CEOs so far for the second phase. But I did in that first phase um, lead the company through to it, profitability, its first profits. And as Kamal will remember well, we had a simple idea at the outset, which was to, to um, gift 5% of our profits to a charity of our own design called Solar Aid, Aid and that was um, designed to. Uh, kick, to get uh, solar entrepreneurs in Africa going and kickstart solar lighting markets, um, which we've been able to do with 5% of profits, annual profits ever since. And this has become something that's become integral to the brand and the culture. It's very important to um, the staff, not, not because they're necessarily, you know, hired for it, but it just somehow becomes something that they do a lot of, there's a lot of volunteering, a lot of fundraising. Some people actually go out and uh, work for SolarAid's retail brand. And you'll all be aware just how vital this stuff is. Um, uh, you know, you've got two options basically out in Africa. If you're off grid, you can burn kerosene um, at an average cost of about $50 a year, rather a lot if your household is on a dollar a day. Or if you have a solar light costing $5 less now, that was the 2018 figure, it, that will last you three to five years. 
you'll save at least $145. Um, and in countries like Malawi, you know, the, the average annual income is 225. So it's, it's, it's vital stuff. Never mind about the, um, never mind uh, about the in environmental imperatives. And for a while with SolarAid, 2012 to 2015, we hit an updraft. We, we found a model that worked in Kenya and Tanzania and um, really took us up a, uh, an exponential growth tra trajectory. Sadly, it didn't continue, but the good news about it not continuing was that by that time there had been a proper industry created and uh, we, had, uh, we had problems to do with um, being caught with too much stock and cash flow crises nearly went under, but succeeded in, in escaping. So we catalyzed two African markets in Kenya and Tanzania. And, um, and now we're still Afri active in, uh, in Zambia and Malawi. And we were able to quantify the impact of all this very carefully with the help of um, Stanford University, ETH Berkeley, and some funding from Google and data analytics from Google. And, you know, it's just incredible to see the impact measured in the field. I'll leave you to read those, but the, the one that I always found fascinating was the 1.9 billion extra study hours for children. And that's the key thing, you know, it's the link to education. There was a time in my life when I would have been horror struck at the idea of a billion extra study hours, but uh, it works. And um, my favorite anecdote of these impacts was when BBC's Newsnight team went out to look at the Kenya operations. Um, interviewed a young fellow that they'd found who'd come in the top 60 nationally in exams. Um, and uh, they asked him how he managed to do that because he lived in the middle of nowhere, a tiny remote school. And he said, it was my solar light. I, I was able to really study very hard. And then the interviewer asked him, what do you want to do with all this for your future? He wants to be a doctor, of course. So, you know, that little anecdote summarizes so much. So here's our second CEO, the wonderful Derry Newman. He was managing director of Sony. So this guy really knew what he was doing and stepped up a, the level of professionalism in the company remarkably. We actually partnered with Tesla in the days when nobody had heard of Tesla. We shared the same investors and the idea was, you know, our solar roof tiles were going to power Tesla Roadsters. <laughs> and everyone would be really happy in the new age of solar and electric vehicles. At the time, very few people believed it. It was impossibly expensive, but again, a sort of whiff of the future coming. And for a while, it looked as though our solar residential roof tiles were going to take off. Um, Derry took the company off into Spain and France and Italy, where the products were, were uh, pretty popular um, in, you know, admittedly for affluent folk. Uh, but we were also getting into big roofs. Our building integrated work was being replaced by massive installations on roofs. This is in Berlin, a, um, a giant roof that was put up in six weeks. And apart from all that, the thing we were most proud of was, you know, um, to be voted one of the best companies to work for. And that comes from the staff. So, uh, you know, there were anonymous questionnaires in this thing and they take it very seriously. But we won one of those. And by 2010, you know, there was a sense of what we now take uh, as routine in the 2020s. You know, solar, the least expensive energy source the world has ever seen, according to the IA that earlier this year. Um, but certainly not then in 2010, but our, our roof tiles are being used more and more and increasingly solar thermal as well for heating and no electricity uh, required in, uh, other than what was being generated on site in this particular development with plenty left over to charge an electric vehicle. So you could smell the future coming at you. And we were um, we won a Queen's Award for Enterprise and Innovation for these roof tile products in 2011. Uh, despite all this, we were we were a, we became a bit of a poster child for um, 
for the, the failure of venture capitalists actually in, um, in the early clean tech years. Patience is a virtue in the hunt for the game-changing green Google. And here are our roof tiles and we're mentioned by name with our Silicon Valley investor vantage point as a kind of um, frustrating case for investors. And, and that's exactly what it was like. We were still back in 2010, the market hadn't properly taken off. Um, so this was all interesting um, history. And in 2011, um, a major setback. In the UK, the, the, the government took a very high level decision uh, to make room for nuclear by getting rid of either offshore wind or solar. And they elected for solar. And so they started policy making to kill. This does actually happen. And you might think I'm being a bit over dramatic at this point, but um, you know, I knew lots of people behind the wire in government and that's what I was told. And much of it had to do with malign lobbying from the oil industry. At that point, there were no secondes from the renewables industries in the British government system, the civil service. The Department of Energy and uh, Environment was stacked with them. Um, and, you know, the, this was a lot of the driver of what happened. So they cut the feed-in tariff dramatically with six weeks notice. Six weeks is the time it takes to ship modules from China to the UK. So overtly aiming to kill the industry, you know, no breathing space. Uh, tens of thousands of job losses projected. And this is the company protesting uh, across the water from the House of Commons. We did more than protest. We took the government to court, uh, initially to the High Court. Um, we won in the High Court. The, um, the legal system ruled that the government had acted illegally. And, um, uh, and they then took, to, took us to the Court of Appeal. We won in the Court of Appeal. And they then took us again to court, to the Supreme Court, where we were with all the organized crime folks and murderers and, you know, <laughs> uh, extraordinary stuff over a period of a few months. And the, the Supreme Court kicked the case out. So, um, you know what, the, the, the lesson here is when governments are really fixed through their belief system on, on making something happen, in this case, leaving space for the nuclear industry to uh, prosper, they are, are capable of extraordinary excesses in defense of their you know, chosen path, uh, especially when they've got so many industry secondes. Anyway, phase two of the four, steady growth in the teeth of recession, second ascent to profitability. This was led by Derry through to 2012 um, and two more rounds of venture capital. So we've clocked up four rounds of venture capital, 28 in all, um, all of them actually in the period when I was CEO through to 2007, we never needed any more money um, up to very recently. And, um, and, and we, we still have that, that capital in the bank. It's been preserved through all, all that time. And this Derry's achievement here was extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary achievement of leadership because you saw how smooth that um, growth curve was, average of 40% growth a year. That's what happened to the solar stocks in that period. The purple next is the... Um, is the solar uh, stock index. And you can see through 2009 uh, and the financial crisis, we were, we were the hero of the markets. And then you see what happened uh, through the recession, the collapse um, in the financial crisis, the recession afterwards, terrible time for solar, lots of companies going bankrupt in that period. Um, very grim indeed. Fortunately for us, um, the pro solar prices had gone so low that we were able to compete under the Renewable Obligation Certificate Scheme, which had been designed for wind, um, and we could make the economics work. But we had to face dysfunctional policy implications because most of the work was done in the run-up to the derogation of the rocks, the, the stepping down of the rocks, 
which was at the end of the financial year, in other words, in March. So therefore we were rushing to install through the winter months. And this was for the engineers, this was a real challenge to say the least, uh, scenes like World War I battlefields. This was after the famous um, flooding of January, 2014. That was our site at Ainsham in Oxfordshire. That was it later in the, in the summer. And that's another of my favorites because Ainsham, it turns out, is in the constituency of the then Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, who never covered himself in glory in any of this stuff through his premiership. 2014, staying with a building integrated, this is the roof of Blackfriars Station. It's the longest solar um, roof uh, bridge in the world. And it was installed above a working, a working station and a working river. So again, fantastic engineering achievements by the team. This is um, a car factory, the Bentley factory. Again, a working factory with the solar being installed above the working um, uh, floor. And so um, wonderful stuff from 2012 through to 2015, uh, doing this kind of thing, ground mounted solar. And at that point, we, um, we had our third CEO, Derry had an illness in his family and had to go off and do care. Um, and gosh, I've just realized people haven't been able to see the right hand side probably. Uh, I think I've corrected that now. There's our third CEO, Franz van den Heuvel, Dutch, um, and he's taken the company all the way through to 20, 2020. Obviously, this PowerPoint will be made available to people afterwards if you want to have a look at it at a more leisurely pace. Um, through this period, you know, increasing professionalism and um, increasing internationalism, uh, um, if that's the right word. Um, and this is one of my favorites. We, we've had six marriages, intra-solar century marriages. This is number four, a favorite of a lot of ours because it didn't involve uh, us Brits. It was Guy, who's Australian, and Sabine, who's German. And, you know, gives you a feel for the, uh, for the culture that was brewing in their company. But uh, in 2015, we came to the end of phase three because there was another um, effort to kneecap the industry. Um, and this time it was immediate, it was literally days after the ministers came back from Paris, having signed the Paris Agreement, um, talking about the need to deal with rising energy bills by getting rid of the green crap. Don't, don't, shoot the pre, don't shoot the messenger for using a rude word there. That was the prime minister's own word for it. That's how they viewed solar, the green crap. And we, of course, were to blame for the high, um, the high energy bills because of the massive subsidies that had gone to um, feeding the growth of the industry through the feed-in tariffs. So again, uh, a big a shock for the industry and it forced us to go, we were already going international. We'd become big enough and well enough capitalized to do that. Um, but after that assault from the UK government, we, we really had to step that up fast and hard. And under France's leadership, we, we were able to grow the pipeline significantly. You see a typical press um, article on, um, on the, uh, growth of the company. We were lucky. Others, compadres of ours, were not so lucky because they didn't have that buffer of cash that we'd had through our fourth fundraising. And the culture stayed through this uh, as we were becoming more and more corporate, I suppose you, you could say. Um, we, we certainly remained spiky. So under France, we, we had uh, people coming in from um, the League of Nations. And this is uh, something we put up on our website on the day of the protests against the um, Brexit vote in the UK, with all the national flags of uh, folk, where they come from, and, you know, quietly stated, you, you don't have to, um, you can read between the lines what most people in Solar Century thought and think 
about the, uh, the Brexit business. And just in passing, you see in the bottom left, our fourth CEO, um, who is from Germany. And this year, uh, with the merger with Statcraft, it is taking over from France. Another of my favorite pictures from this time at the protests, the Extinction Rebellion protests, where a lot of staff, you know, um, nothing organized at the company level, but, um, you know, voluntary uh, attendance and lots of staff turned up for this. And here's a young lady from the engineering team taking it upon herself to help young kids decorate their cheeks with the Extinction Rebellion uh, symbol. So now we get to the present, November 2020, and eventually, you know, you, you're, you're growing so fast, you need a bigger balance sheet. And so for quite a while, the current board had been looking for, for that. Um, and the four VC groups majority own the company. So um, we found a home with Statcraft, which is the Norwegian state renewables company. I'm sure people would know of it. Um, and that is where, as of this month, the Solar Century team will be resident in six months, absorbed into Statcraft. So it's a congruent home for the DNA that we've created in our 20 year journey. But that DNA will continue because there are more than a thousand current staff and alumni, uh, 220 or thereabouts current staff. This is a group of um, early staff. Many of these folk uh, were with me all the way through. Uh, just behind me in this picture is the finance director who has worked with me for 22 years. And we're staying working together in this next phase. All the kids you see in this photo uh, were born uh, obviously during the time of Solar Century's existence, and three of those couples are uh, marriages from within the company. So um, all these folk, thousand plus folk, I think I would be right in saying are proud to varying degrees of, to have a, played a role in what's um, emerged as the story of our industry. As everyone here will know, solar is the least expensive option in most markets now. And here you see the stats for the last 10 years summarized by the IEA. So with our sister wind, we're knocking spots off everyone else. And I just wanna close with a few thoughts about um, cultures and belief systems and all the rest of it. You, uh, the BP was so right back in 2000, but they weren't able to do anything about it. And none of their fellow oil and gas companies, you know, showed much sign then or, or really since in going with this flow. So you have to ask yourself, how can an industry be so systemically blind to that kind of risk, which is now transparently existential risk for such a long period of time? And in my um, analysis for what it's worth, you can't just blame the oil and gas industry. There is a bigger issue, a bigger problem here. Um, and the fact is that investor norms have encouraged them to behave this way. So there's something in the system. There's something about the guardians of capital and how they behave um, that has created this uh, dysfunctional system, which is going to destroy value for so many people. And I think, you know, this, of course, begins to sound like a bit of a, um, a, a political analysis but I don't think it's that controversial. And the Financial Times, uh, many people here will know, ran a very long series last year on capitalism time for a reset with exactly this kind of thinking and lots of deep analysis. But uh, you know, the oil and gas industry is very resilient in its belief system. And this is a snapshot of it. This is the former chief executive of uh, BP, Tony Hayward, the guy who was in charge when they reversed out of the Beyond Petroleum um, years. He's also now uh, chair of Glencore. So here you see him and me in December 2016, not that long ago, a year after Paris. And there he is persuading pension funds, a conference of pension funds, that it's quite, it's really safe to invest in oil and gas and actually coal as well, if you want, because he 
represents Glencore. And there's me sitting on the right, you know, trying not to break the world record for blood pressure. Uh, especially when you know, as I do, what they have done behind closed doors. So they, the things they say in public are one thing, but you get um, the activity uh, below the counter behind closed doors. And I, all the, through these years, I've been trusted enough by folk in the industry and government to be told what, what's going on. And this is one example, a very senior, very senior PR industry executive in one of the big companies that you would recognize if I um, uh, was indiscreet, uh, took me out for a coffee one day, conscience stricken and said, they're using black arts to try and kill you. And now, of course, he didn't mean literally kill me. He didn't mean me as a, as a whole, but he meant the, the, the embryonic renewables industries. They've tried everything they can, including disinformation, fake news in the modern parlance to, um, to set us back. And despite that, this is what has happened um, on our watch. And um, Solar Century's, you know, been a, a bit part player in that. We are now, solar is now the cheapest electricity in history, um, uh, according to the IEA. And the great thing is, for those of you who, um, uh, you know, have the uh, experience of going into this industry and working for it or other renewables or other clean energy um, allied industries, many in our industry now seem to agree that, um, that, that we, we can go all the way, 100% renewable energy is possible. This is a vote in February, just before the lockdown in Brussels of an industry conference where, um, you know, it was put to the audience and more, can we go 100% renewable energy, not electricity, energy. And more than half of them put their hands up. And that's really gratifying because that wasn't always the case. Um, and on the panel, um, I sat there with um, folk from NL and Vestas, and we all argued, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So ultimately, this can be a very good news story. Uh, we're seeing it in the stock markets. This was as of July this year, when um, BP's stock price market capitalization was closing in on um, Orsteds, a renewable giant, giant that had once itself been an oil company. Um, that they that's now crossed. So Orsted is now worth considerably more than BP. So final thought in the talk is, you know, where's it going? Where's it going to end? Can we beat climate change? Um, and the answer is yes, in principle, uh, because we see what can happen, even when there, there's, um, as it were, enemy action and rear guard actions by the incumbency um, in the actual energy emissions. This can, this can be repeated in other sectors. Um, we also know that we've got to suck carbon out of the atmosphere um, and this is going to be where the end game will be fought. So this is where I've elected to spend, you know, the last years of my vocational life in the bioeconomy, as it were. And here too, you know, real um, source, sources for optimism. This is HSBC, just a snapshot, an example. You know, one of the worst, worst uh, funders of, of fossil fuels all the way through. They're still not perfect, but this is their uh, latest asset management offering. Um, nature is capital, they announce with um, ease in inverted in commas. The simple truth is that failing to understand the resilience of nature means failing to understand in the resilience of the economy. Nature is now the most fertile investment we have. HSBC, honestly, sometimes people have no shame but that's okay, as long as they're going in the right direction. And, um, and so here's the uh, east facing slope of my um, project, which I'm intending to turn into the mother of all carbon sinks, but a biodiverse carbon sink through um, guardianship of these ancient woodlands, through planting, regenerating, restoring the peat bogs that exist on the top and you know, hoping to turn that into an exemplar that will help encourage others to um, replicate in the bioeconomy uh, the, the great dramatic story we've seen in the solar and wind markets. 
that's what I wanted to say. I hope that's useful. And I'm sure um, Kamal and team will be um, passing the, the PowerPoint over if you want to um, have a look at it. And there's a ton more stuff on my website, which is the breathtakingly original jeremyleggett.net. There we are. How do we do the Q and A? Oh yes, you're going to you're going to pass the, you're going to screen the you're going to do yeah. the questions on that. Yeah. yeah, I'll I'll I've been looking through them in the chat and thank you so much for that talk, Jeremy. That was a fascinating tour of the industry and um, I really yeah like the way you brought it all together at the end. That was a a lot of good food for thought. Um, so I'm going to jump in and call on some folks who have submitted questions in the chat and some of them yeah if you see other people's questions and you like them I'll I'll kind of rise those up. But um, let's see, there was a question back uh, at the sort of towards the beginning from Hugh about the solar industry industry in Africa. Hugh, do you want to summarize your question a little better than that? <laughs> um, it sounded like uh, uh, Solar Century had done uh, development in Africa. I don't know whether that was uh, African factories. Um, but I'm very curious uh, what obstacles uh, you see to further developing the solar industry uh, manufacturing within Africa. Yeah, uh, we have done, Solar Century has been um, active in Africa. We've done hybrid projects uh, with solar and batteries, both in commercial buildings and ground mounted. Uh, we've done some really, you know, in encouraging projects where we can beat the opposition um, hands down on cost. Uh, but you know, it's it's very it's uh, it's very difficult operating in Africa, and this hasn't been anything like as successful as the operations we've had in Europe and Latin America, sadly. Um, and I think, you know. Uh, it's a difficult, really difficult to sort of put your finger on any, any one thing or combination of reasons, but um, it's weird that the, the sunniest place, one of the sunniest places on the planet has just so little solar still installed. And there's a job of work um, still to be done there uh, by uh, intrepid entrepreneurs. I'm sure it'll change. But uh, you know, there's everything to play for there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that answer. Um, and I'm going to go next to Britt's question because a few people um, had the same question, and yeah, it's been repeated actually in the chat here. Uh, Britt, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. So I noticed that probably a few of your earlier installations are reaching the end of their lifespan. So I was kind of curious about development towards recycling and retirement of solar panel e-waste. And later on down in the chat, Alita actually also asked about sourcing solar panel materials and as well as recycling. So I just wondered what kind of development you've, uh, you've been seeing in that space. Well, um, the, the, uh, they have 20 year warranties, but you know, I would say a lot of these early installations will, will keep on going. You know, there are, there are solar panels out there that are 40 years old in the field and they've you know maybe dropped 10 or 15 percent in uh, um, production capacity compared to when they started life but they're still barreling away so uh, that's not to get away from the, the question about recycling um, but they will be operating I'm, I'm sure for quite a while the the industry does have recycling initiatives um, I can't pretend that they are as good as I would like. They're certainly not close to being the um, circular economy that we need. But, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that that, that, will, uh, that that will change. Um, sourcing the material. So you, you're doubtless well aware that our supply, that the industry supply chain is pretty much in, entirely in China. Um, and, you know, we can all have an opinion as to whether that's a um, constructive situation for everybody, including the Chinese, I, I might add. You know, it's probably better to have at least uh, regional vertically integrated supply chains. So in Europe, 
uh, ideally we would have our own vertically integrated supply chain. We don't through um, you know, all sorts of reasons to do with the difficulty, I think primarily the difficulty that go many governments have had of, of accepting the, the, the potency of solar. So we do what we can in China. In the case of Solar Century, we of course do factory inspections. We uh, we don't just say we'll take your panels, however they've been made. And there's one um, example in history where we we actually read an article in the New York Times about a company up the supply chain of one of our main suppliers in China that had been carrying toxic chemicals out of the gate. It wasn't a module factory; it was a um, an ingot a sort of melting of silicon uh, institution at carrying um, uh, toxic material out of the gate and dumping, <laughs> dumping stuff in the drains. So we, um, uh, we, we took, I took that to the CEO of the big module manufacturing company that uh, we knew were being supplied by, by these folks. In fact, we'd read it in the paper. And I said, look, this is just not on you. you we can't be dealing with this. And um, that, that company cut off the supply from, from the silicon, um, the upstream player that had been guilty of this. So, you know, I think uh, it, it's, there's, I'm not gonna pretend for a minute that the solar industry um, can't improve, it can improve a lot, but it's not hopeless. And of course, the backup argument is, look at the casebook of stories from <laughs> from what we're competing with then it's a relative you know, the questions are relative mm. yeah thanks thanks, thanks Sorry to cut you off, Britt. <laughs> um, so we've had a, a bundle of questions coming up around the economics, the dramatic decline in cost of solar and sort of what drives that and what does that mean for other carbon and climate mitigating technologies, um, in, especially including storage. So a lot of people have po pointed out the uh, intermittency of solar and wind and the higher costs right now of storage as well as the environmental costs of some storage technologies. So I think there's just like a, a thematic question around um, what lessons can be learned from the declining cost of solar for other technologies and how does storage come into play here? Um, like how can it keep up with the growth that's needed? Yeah, I think the, the big lesson is have faith because you know those of us at the outset when we were arguing um, that solar was going to be uh, you know really on a steep descending cost trajectory, we said, look, this is, this is tech. The, the, these are semiconductors. Look what's happened in the dig digital revolution. It's gonna happen with energy as well. And of course the old fossils and the nuclear folks said, oh, dream on, you know, you're a rootless dreamer. That's what I, one energy minister said that to me on a platform. Um, you know, this is just hideously expensive. There's no way it will ever compete with nuclear and gas. I mean, um, anyway, so have faith because the same thing is is happening in batteries. Uh, you know, they're a bit behind us, but it's it's going to happen. And you know, even in the even if we took, were to take the ludicrously conservative view that somehow battery storage won't live up to the same kind of promise, uh, general promise that that solar has. The ability of solar to mix and match with wind is so spectacular. If um, you know the load, the load profiles match so well. So storage is icing on the cake. And for those of those folk who aren't necessarily um, that e expert on it, but want to get quickly into into the guts of the argument, there's the one thing I'd recommend is the the modeling work done by the Finnish Technical University at Lapin Ranta. It's a bit of a it's on my website. There's a whole presentation on their work. And this is the, it's an international modeling team, um, German led, uh, German funded, but it's in Finland. And uh, the, they're the first people to take global energy supply, not electricity, but energy of all sorts across the economies and model what it would take to do that um, with uh, solar, wind and storage, battery storage for the most part 
how much it would cost relative to fossil alternatives and how quickly it could be done. And I'm not going to spoil the, uh, the punchline for you, but, you know, just really, really recommend that you Google that and, um, and, and get encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so I, I realize we're kind of running a little short on time here. So I think I'm going to ask Tristan and Aman to ask your questions back to back that are related to the nature based climate solutions and um, rewilding project so that we can touch on that. And then Jeremy, if it's okay with you, I'll send you a few more of these bundled by themes in an email that we can maybe follow up that way um, also. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. So Aman, do you wanna ask your question from a little earlier and then Tristan and we'll kind of wrap up with this theme of rewilding and how to plug, plug in all of our skill sets to have the highest impact that we can. Uh, uh, so my question is more in uh, in relation to the initiative which you uh, mentioned about HSB. Uh, so as I was reading a couple of articles and I've worked a bit, so I wanted to understand how, uh, that there is a huge demand for nature-based climate solutions, uh, at least from the uh, big investors. So, But there are not many reliable projects uh, when it comes to uh, nature-based solutions. So how can that bridge be... Uh, uh, mean, uh, can how can that gap be bridged, and what are your thoughts on uh, what can be done in that uh, context? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay, um, Maybe if it's okay, can we just have Tristan chime in because his question was kind of similar, and then you can um, link them together? Is that okay, sure. Tristan? Um, go ahead. <laughs> Hi there, um, thanks a lot for the uh, the great talk, um, really inspiring. Uh, I just wanted to ask about your uh, your next efforts and in comparison to your former efforts in regards to uh, carbon carbon sequestration is obviously a passion of yours, um, but you're working now in um, rewilding efforts to create a large carbon sink in Scotland. And I'm just wondering if you were to rewind back however many years ago and you had the choice between those two options, which would you have gone for? Um, and fast forwarding to today, which would you recommend is requires more focus at this point in terms of either solar energy or rewilding as a form of, of mitigating climate change? Thanks. Yeah, um, good questions. Um, I don't, I don't think it's it's certainly not a question of either or, but and for me personally, um, one of the things that I found so exhilarating in the early years of solar was the sense of the frontier. You know, you, you, have, you have a story that you want to tell, you've got to persuade people. And, um, you know, in many ways you're going against the flow um, on a frontier. And I think there's an element of that with um, nature-based solutions now. It's not so acute. There's, there's clearly an emerging consensus that this is just going to be vitally important as the over-the-top HSBC quotes um, suggest. But um, it's, it really is a frontier. And I think those of you who've looked at carbon trading and, um, and an, an offset, the offset carbon story will be aware that there, that there is a lot of really flaky use of science out there. People prepared to say, oh yes, we're offsetting our emissions. I'm really having no idea um, really materially about what the, um, the, the, the science is behind that. So those of us who, who care about um, verifying um, accountancy, natural capital accountancy, have a big kind of a big role to play and I'm really hoping this this uh, project of mine can be one of the centers um, where where people do verification science so we with this place will be will be festooned with flux towers and sensors of all kinds we, we will be um, on the frontiers of, of quantifying what goes down into peat bogs, what goes down into trees, different species, different ages of trees, all this kind of thing. 
And um, I think that there's a vital role for that kind of use of science to interface with um, capital and the capital markets. So I, I fully expect over the next few years, for example, to see the ratings agencies that are so important in the investment world become fully focused on, on what's happening in natural capital accountancy. So it's a very, very exciting frontier area that, um, that it sort of is fundamentally important, you know, if you're a climate campaigner, as I see myself being. Um, and it's different from solar. I don't want to talk, uh, talk anyone out of going into the solar industry because there's still so much vital work to be done, but it's of a different nature now. It's of a um, large scale industrialization nature. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd probably better shut up at that point because I really don't want to put anyone off going into the solar industry. It's just that my personal, my personal um, inclinations are towards the frontier science and, and Kamal will know what I mean because she saw the very early years. And, and so I think the best way I can describe it to you guys is um, I, uh, I'm no expert on this stuff that I'm doing. I'm on steep learning curves. I feel like I'm back at university. Uh, I have that same feeling of the thrill of discovery and, you know, that big world that's out there. Um, but of course, it, uh, um, it's what's driving me is my, is my climate campaigning instincts. So it's the right, it feels like the right place for me to be. But um, that's not to say that I think, you know, it, it's for anyone and everyone, if you see what I mean. Mm, yeah. Thanks for that for that response, Jeremy. That was a really good way of integrating those last two questions. And um, I faced a similar position when when asked at Terra, like, what's the most you know best way we can have an impact on climate change? And it really is this blending of skill sets and personalities and interests and experience, and obviously knowledge of the important mitigation levers to pull on. So that's something we're hoping to build up in this course: is that that knowledge and awareness. Um, Kamal, did you have anything else to add before we wrap up? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been amazing. Great to hear the whole story because, you know, I, I left very early on. Um, I actually only had, I had only a one-year visa. I, could, I couldn't stay past that in the UK. Um, uh, but I, I, uh, I really appreciated the sort of the whole story as well. And um, really excited for this new adventure you're on. And I, I wanted to say that if you have any specific research projects, we have you know a cohort of 140 hungry learners. So if you have anything that needs, you know, needs some brain power, we've got everything from data scientists to marketing experts to teachers to legal experts to you know a whole range of skills. Yes, there you go. Exactly. Um, farmers, that's right, actual farmers as well. Yes. Um, so we you know, feel free to share some projects with us if you have some something you need extra help with, and we'll we'll put the our collective brain power to work. So yeah, and thank you so much, Jeremy. There's a lot of stuff on my website, and Q and A is on the uh, on the Bunloit project and all that sort of thing. So, you know, if people are interested in aspects of it, that there, there's plenty of follow up opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, That's Jeremy. Great to hear. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate your time today. <laughs> Thank you, guys, and um, enjoy the rest of your days. You yes. too. Thank Bye -bye. you all. I'll save the chat and end the recording.